participants uh, welcome back to lecture number 3 of this 14 day lecture series of dialectics on contemporary theories today we have among us dr pritish Chak uh, chakraborty and uh, dr pritish has been with us uh, in 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 previous occasions and uh, i am sure most of you in this uh, in this gathering will definitely benefit from his scholastic abilities on behalf of dr of on behalf of team dad voyage it's an absolute honor and pleasure to welcome you again dr pritish thank you very much and it's an absolute honor to to introduce dr pritish chakraborty to all of you uh, dear participants uh, dr pritish is presently working as an assistant professor of english at acharya shukumar sen mahavidyalay in west bengal he is a former fulbright foreign language teaching assistant at new york university from 2018 to 2019 he has obtained his phd from west bengal state university he has obtained his mphil from calcutta university and presently is researching on superhero comic books of batman and indian comics he is interested in creative writing and has published a long story in <laughs> kindle direct publishing he has also penned a couple of scripts for comic books which is awaiting publication has to his he has to his credit several published articles in national and international journals and has chapters in books and attended a few seminars and conferences both of world repute in india as well as abroad on behalf of team dad voyage dr shreya ma'am and myself dr pritish we welcome you once again thank you uh the platform is all yours dr pratish thank you so much uh, for the detailed uh, introduction uh, dr banerji uh, thank you uh, dr potacharji also for uh, allowing me to present um my uh, ideas on uh, post structuralism and deconstruction and it is an outline it, it cannot be an in depth thing within these 2 hours it would require like two centuries for me to get around post structuralism and deconstruction all at the same time so it's just an outline that i will be providing uh, today so uh, let me uh, go to the next slide and begin the uh, presentation let me know if the slide uh, changes um which it doesn't here is it changing on the on your screen is it going to the next slide no not yet now yeah now, right? now now yes so i think there is some uh, issues with uh, zoom aligning with uh, the ppts anyway so <clears throat> first i would like to uh, understand or first i would like to uh, tell what post structuralism is not so it is not a humanistic way of looking at things because like all uh isms like all uh theories like all uh, uh discourses on uh, theory and criticism post structuralism is uh not really very human centric it's not homo centric to begin with and it's not well easy for a number of uh, people including me i group i have a difficult time understanding uh, what post structuralism is and it is not a movement since the propounders disowned any labeling themselves so it is not humanistic it is not easy and it is not a movement per se um so what is post structuralism so you can say that it's a sum total of intellectual movements of french and uh, continental philosophers and uh, theorists Uh, who rejected the methods and assumptions of analytical uh, philosophy it is a reaction against anything that is solid so anything that is solid is not post structuralist because anything solid has a structure inside it so post structuralism according to uh, j a cadden and i'm uh, quoting from the dictionary of literary terms and theory it is a long quote and you can read it on your own but i'm like reading it uh, along with you so post structuralism is a more rigorous working out of the possibilities and implications and shortcomings of structuralism so as the name suggests post structuralism so it comes after structuralism and as like post uh, other things like post modernism or post colonialism 
or anything that comes like after something, it tries to uh, uh, work out the implications and shortcomings that were there in structuralism and its uh, basics in Saussurean linguistics itself. So in a sense, it complements structuralism by offering alternative modes of inquiry, explanation, and interpretation. Uh, Post-structuralism tends to reveal that the meaning of any text of itself, its, of its own nature, is unstable. It reveals that signification is, of course, of, of its nature, unstable. So signification and meaning of any text is unstable. And what this unstability invites and what this unstability does to the text will be discussed in detail uh, in, in the following um, uh, slides. So post-structuralism pursues further the Saussurean perception that uh, in a language, excuse me, that uh, in, in language, there are only differences without positive terms. Now, this, is, this was this famous uh, concept uh, by uh, Saussure that um, uh, in language, there are only differences without positive terms and shows that the signifier and signified are, as it were, not only oppositional, but plural pulling against each other and by so doing, creating numerous deferments of meaning. Deferments here means that there will be delay in the assumption or there will be a delay in the consumption or understanding or comprehension of meaning if there is any comprehension at the end of the entire exercise. Apparently, endless crisscrossing patterns and sequences of meaning. So there is not one single meaning, but there are meanings and they crisscross each other, they uh, uh, conflict with each other. A belief in the incommensurate qualities of language, language is a form of inadequacy according to post-structuralism, and this is, the, this is basic to post-structuralist thinking, and this is according to J.A. Cudden uh, in his book, in his Dictionary of Literary Terms and Theory. So there is an assumption that language is a form of inadequacy, and that there are there are conflicting tendencies within the most simplest units of language which we have come to know as a unit of communication as a system of uh, uh, making things understood by each other now what is deconstruction i will be uh, talking about uh, post structuralism and then i'll be talking about deconstruction like with both hands inside it and on one hand, I will be talking about post structuralism. On another hand, I will be talking about deconstruction. So there will be like two parallel um, good strain uh, going on two parallel uh, lines. Okay, let's see where they go, or I don't know if it will derail in the middle. Let's see, let's hope for the best. So, what is deconstruction? Now, uh, Harold Pinter once was asked that what are your plays about like what is the meaning of the plays that you uh, write what is the actual sense that you want to give and he said the sense that, that is there in the in, in his plays is that the weasel under the cocktail cabinet what does it mean i mean what, what whatever can it mean that there is a weasel under the cocktail cabinet and that is one of the meanings of deconstruction that it cannot mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. But there are a number of definitions. There are a number of ways in which deconstruction has been uh, understood or uh, deconstruction itself has been uh, or ha has been attempted to be described by uh, uh, Derrida himself. So the dictionary meaning of deconstruction says this, that deconstruction is the action of deconstructing. And it's, it could be a grammatical term as well. And as a grammatical term, it might mean disarranging the construction of words in a sentence. And it is a French term. And I can barely uh, pronounce this uh, term, but I wrote down the pronunciation so that I do not uh, uh, mistake the pronunciation. It's deconstruire. I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's kind of French and I, I, I uh, barely uh, can pronounce it, but it's a French term and it can come to mean these things. To disassemble the parts of a whole, to deconstruct a machine, to transport it elsewhere, which is not related with, I mean, a machine is not 
uh, something that we are going to talk about. But as uh, Dr. Banerjee was pointing out that uh, since he had uh, changed his device, there were some problems, some issues with um, uh, the, the Zoom uh, meeting thing. So, and the number and another meaning of, of uh, deconstruction according to the dictionary is that to deconstruct verse, rendering it by the suppression of meter similar to prose. So deconstruction can be used in verse, and when we are going to use it in verse, uh, it mean it would mean uh, the suppression of the meter, and then it will become similar to prose. And the third meaning is to deconstruct itself, that is to lose its construction. And uh, Derrida uh, uh, says uh, in a letter to a Japanese uh, friend where he was trying to understand what uh, uh, deconstruction is, he says that modern scholarship has shown us that in a region of timeless East, a language reaching its own state of perfection and altered from within itself, according to the single law of change natural to the human mind. So the idea that I mean, if if I if I want to say what deconstruction is about, or one of the one of the major ideas of deconstruction is, I believe the one of the major ideas of deconstruction is that the seeds of the destruction of an idea lies within itself. Like whatever is, whatever has been, whatever is out there, including language will be destroyed by its own self, the destruction or the alteration, the changes, the deconstruction will come from within rather from any other external point, from any other external um, uh, source. And you can apply now, uh, while we were discussing about this uh, lecture, we were talking about applying the theory. I mean, okay, you can understand what deconstruction is. So deconstruction is an idea or a philosophy or a concept that says that the seeds of the destruction of an idea lies within itself. Like language uh, can change when it reaches a state of perfection and it is deconstructed from within uh, itself. Something becomes too big, it starts to break and change. Um, it starts to mutate. Um, so, but then how are we going to apply it in, in our everyday uh, literary uh, exercises? So whenever a text is written, whenever uh, um, a painting is made, whenever we are doing something, uh, our own efforts to create it create some point within the text, within the painting, within the sculpture, within the uh, building architecture, a point of weakness, where from it starts to break, where from it starts to fall apart, a weak spot. So the weak spot is not brought out from outside, but the weak spot is born as soon as the creation takes its birth. I mean, uh, in science, if we uh, if we take uh, refuge to science, then uh, we we start moving towards our death, the point at which we start breathing, because technically we our cells are oxidized, and it is oxidized because we take in oxygen. But if we do not take oxygen, then we will die anyway. So uh, oxygen gives us life and death all at the same time. We will discuss this in detail in the later uh, slides, applying right itself onto some uh, texts or a number of texts. Now, deconstruction is not a method and cannot be transformed into one. So deconstruction is something that is not palpable. Deconstruction is something that cannot be done. I mean, that is one of the features or what is, that is one of the definitions of deconstruction. It must also be made clear that deconstruction is not even an act or an operation. So by saying what deconstruction is, we are actually saying what deconstruction is not. Or by saying what deconstruction is not, we are trying to say what deconstruction is. So by uh, explaining away or by neg negating a number of things that we could attach 
on to deconstruction deconstruction rejects those definitions deconstruction rejects those ideas and says that this is not deconstruction i often use uh, this idea that i got from uh, someone or some place that you know when you're trying to define deconstruction what you're trying to do is you're taking a, a bit of a jelly and trying to uh, throw it on the ceiling and nail it with a with a name see the, the jelly will not stick to the ceiling and it will uh, fall on your head and it will make a mess of it and the jelly will be well destroyed so you should rather eat your eat your jelly anyway so um deconstruction takes place it is an event that does not await the deliberation consciousness or organization of a subject or even modernity so deconstruction means is something that is autonomous of our deliberation of our consciousness or organization of a subject or even modernity so deconstruction happens as soon as construction happens the moment you start building something up it is the very moment when the building or when the construction starts to rot starts to get destroyed so deconstruction is a continuous process along with creation or construction now so when uh, the reader was asked that uh, you know can you define deconstruction and this is the answer that he gave um, so he says that all sentences of the type deconstruction is x or deconstruction is not x a priori miss the point which is to say that they are at least false as you know one of the principal things at stake in what is called in my text deconstruction is precisely the delimiting of ontology and above all of the third person present indicative s is p so what is stake the principal things that are at stake in his texts uh, deconstruction whichever texts deal with deconstruction is the delimiting of ontology that ontology is the study of the nature of things that how they uh, began where they began from uh, so deconstruction is liberating the limiting factors of ontology that we cannot find the origin we we can search for it but we are not going to find the origin so there's a delimiting of ontology there is no way where we can go to the original definition of at least deconstruction that's what derida is saying and the third person present indicative that is s is p this is our uh, this has been the western way of gathering and pointing out to knowledge this is p this is s i am pritesh uh you are uh, uh listening to me this is the zoom app uh this is this is earth and this is and this is so on and so forth but deconstruction tries to say that this this habit of third person present indicative that is the the, the pointing out the interpolation of things does not apply all the time and according to deconstruction it does not apply at all okay so what deconstruction is not i mean this is the reader's own saying what deconstruction is not everything of course what is deconstruction nothing activity uh, more of a linguistic uh, gymnastics as uh, we can say uh, than and than something uh, very uh, tangible than something which is uh, very much um, out there which we can uh, gather uh, let me know if i have lost connection because there was this ominous sound on my end no which, you are there we okay, are okay all right Thank i you. mean sometimes this ominous sound comes to my ears like tang tang and it makes me think that okay i'm losing connection because it happens okay thank you so much thank you next the heideggerian now the 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 outside concept i mean other than derida what we think what we can think of of deconstruction is that it is the heideggerian concept of above or destruction not destruction 
but destruction. Now, uh, if you have ever seen a building being taken apart, brick by brick, uh, there also you need uh, uh, a mason, what we in Bengali call a Rajmistri. Without a person like that, you, you as a layman cannot go and deconstruct the building. You cannot take out the bricks, you cannot take out the uh, rods, and you cannot take out even the, the rubbish that you often need to fill up something else. So the Heideggerian concept of above or de destruction is, is something which is a scientific taking apart of a concept or a language or a text and uh, this uh, deconstruction follows this idea. So deconstruction is also a kind of a construction. So whenever, even if you're destroying something, there is a method in that madness. And you can say that deconstruction is that method in the madness. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I believe that uh, uh, whenever we talk about these isms, um, what we are really talking about are the key terms and ideas that are there in it. You cannot say this is post-structuralism, but I think you can say, okay, post-structuralism is about these things. And don't be confused by the numbering. It's a post-structuralist numbering, okay? I mean, I have tried to um, uh, put some like, uh, post-structuralist humor inside my uh, presentation by numbering these terms, not by any kind of regular uh, numbering uh, technique, but by uh, randomly applying some uh, numbering, some uh, identification onto these uh, ideas. Now, the first one is disseminations. Well, if you are done uh, smiling or laughing at uh, the ow, ow, ow um, thing, what I really mean by dissemination is that it comes from this spreading of the seeds. So semen or, 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 or semen, uh, which are Latin terms, uh, uh, gave meaning to disseminations. So disseminations is the spreading like uh, Shah Rukh Khan and Amresh Puri are doing. They are like spreading the seeds uh, for the um, pigeons to uh, eat. And uh, while spreading, we do not know where one seed goes and where another seed goes. Once the seed is out from your hand, once the text is published, once the text is being said, once I utter some words from my mouth, it is open to interpretation. Anybody can interpret in any way whatsoever. So disseminations actually refer to the endless interpretations of a text. So text exists and endless interpretations also exist. You can interpret a text in any manner whatsoever. Now, this is not what I say. This is what post-structuralists say. And this is what is one of the main ideas of post-structuralism. Whereas some orthodox people, some orthodox um, <coughs> philosophers, analytical philosophers or structuralists would say that, no, this means this, okay? Uh, this uh, ow, ow, ow means come, come, come. But in another language, it could mean, mean something very different. And uh, these two people can be interpreted uh, uh, doing something very different than what we know as a cultural unit uh, for them to be uh, doing. So can we apply it? Can we apply this idea on a literary text? I have tried to apply it on uh, this uh, famous poem by uh, Shakespeare, uh, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, sonnet number 18. Now, summer, let us take up this word summer. Uh, in England and India, summer could have very different interpretations. I mean, again, in India also, summer in, uh, say, uh, Leh Ladakh or summer in Himachal Pradesh and summer in Kolkata, where I am from mean very different things. We hate summer, like I hate summer. I mean, I can't, I can't even think what summer would be like, okay? Uh, 
but in england summer is something pleasurable so if i am comparing my friend with uh, summer then i think i am i i really hate my friend so this in th this is what dissemination could mean like once the text is out and there is no uh, uh, no uh, bolding there is no no point where where the author could say that you know i don't mean indian summer what i mean is uh, english summer so uh, again there are two more uh, words which we can take up I mean, there are these two words there in the uh, poem, which we can see in the later slides, but I'm not going right right now, but we can go back uh, and uh, come back here. So these words are more temperate. So more temperate is a relative term. It is not the most temperate. So if summer's day is like 1% pleasurable or 1% good or nice, then we can assume that the friend is like 2% nice as opposed to something else. So uh, more temperate, which is like not much. So if, if you are 2% of something, uh, well, then uh, if, if you have 100% of something else as compared to 2%, then you're not uh, very temperate and you are you now in the gray zone. Again, in pride and prejudice, let us take a pride and prejudice, which is again, another canonical, well-researched, well-established uh, text, and it has been read by almost everybody in the world. But then that brings us to uh, a problem. Now, it says that there's a truth that is universally acknowledged. This is how the, the uh, novel begins, that it is a truth universally acknowledged, so on and so forth. So what is this universally uh, actually uh, uh, come to mean? Does it mean the same thing in different cultures? So uh, if you take into consideration, uh, like even their culture, like in England or America or the Western hemisphere, even in their culture, what I think uh, is this, that if you are in possession of a good fortune, why would you like to uh, give half of it uh, to your wife? Like, why would you even look for a wife? It is actually the other way around. And the, the irony is inherent, even when, uh, Jane Austen was writing it, the irony was inherent that it is not the person who is in a position of a good fortune is in want of wife. It is rather the wife or the would-be wife or the lady who is of marriageable age is looking for a person who is in position of good fortune. But things have changed and even in different cultures, different this could be interpreted in very uh, different ways. And what is even meant by the term universal? Which universe are we talking about? Like Earth is just a planet in the universe. So in this way, we can like go on and on by creating levels of interpretations. Uh, we, we can in introduce culture, we can introduce society, we can introduce every possible thing that can be introduced in the, uh, in, in the interpretation of uh, the things. So um, next, the next idea uh, of, of uh, post-structuralism that we would like to discuss and apply is discourse. Now, this idea was talked about or, or uh, disseminated, you can say, by Foucault. I mean, discourse meant so many other things earlier. But according to Foucault, who is a post-structuralist, uh, uh, discourse is ways of constituting knowledge together with the social practices. The discourse is a way of constituting knowledge together with the social practices. So on one hand, there are these social practices. And then on another hand, there are these um, ways of constituting knowledge. How can we apply it on, on some texts that are there in various uh, syllabi, as I understand throughout uh, the CBCS system that we have right now? Um, though I am taking up a less uh, canonical text, but within the canon of uh, Urdu translation in English, within the canon of Sadat Hasan Manto, this uh, uh, short story, Toba Takes Him, is another kind of a you know canonical uh, text. So in Toba Takes Him, uh, if you have read uh, the short story, if you haven't, do read it. Uh, it is not clear as to who the 
who who is mentally deranged who is mentally differently abled whether it is the inmates of that mental asylum or whether it is the people who had partitioned the country the partition itself is based on very arbitrary lines there is no logic there is no um there is no reason there is no uh, uh consideration before the people who had uh, created this uh, uh, uh partition thing and then let us if if we come to uh, shall i compare the to a summer stay again there is this discourse of beauty so the beauty is compared with summer's day now if i want to compare beauty in india i i don't really want to com compare the beauty with a summer's day and why just day why not night like why didn't shakespeare uh, compare uh, anything with uh, the night however even when uh, uh, there is this comparison or there is this identification of beauty along uh, with the night there are some problems and this poem uh, she walks in beauty like the night by uh, uh, lord byron it's a very short poem she walks in beauty like the night um even there when he compares the beauty of a lady with the night then the night brings in the associations of uh, ignorance associations of a uh, loss of vision association of uh, ominous activities or the association of evil that we usually think arises in during the night time so uh, i mean there is this uh, uh, meme that i i am reminded of that if you associate every wrong thing with like whatever i am going to say then what am i going to say anyway so post structuralism and within the idea of post structuralism within the discourse of post structuralism this discourse is something that foucault uh, says is is creating some idea of beauty which is not always authentic i mean shakespeare himself broke this a uh, whole discourse uh, of beauty by talking about uh, the beauty of the dark lady so was uh, shakespeare thinking in post structuralist terms maybe similarly you can apply this idea of discourse and the creation of knowledge with the help of textbooks dictionaries manuals um pamphlets movies uh, animations songs whatever to create a particular thing which is not in itself something that really matters or means next is intertextuality now i am uh, i i watch these uh, movies i am a comic book enthusiast and uh, i thought that the the idea of intertextuality developed by julia kristeva uh, would not be better uh, represented Uh, by any other image than this image where the end game is on and uh, people uh, uh, from all marvel universe comes together all the heroes are here i mean if you uh, see uh, then then uh, and and they are fighting the ultimate uh, villain who is like going to destroy the whole universe so every other text every other possible text is here right now but when we look at individual scenes of the fight then we find that somebody is fighting somebody like uh, most of the people who are not so uh, uh, not not highlighted in the movie captain america and uh, thor are fighting um thanos so there are uh, uh mingling commingling of texts but what the, what what does it really mean actually so kristeva said that intertextuality is something that is the whole the, the whole gamut of literature the whole gamut of written or spoken literature because whatever we write has already been written no matter what we write no matter what we say has already been written has already been said and we are drawing 
one person is drawing things from some other text. For example, Obijana Shokuntalam. Uh, the story of Obijana Shokuntalam was actually taken from Mahabharata, first book. So this is Obijana Shakuntalam is not something that came out of the mind of uh, Kalidasa himself, but he adapted the story from some epic, from some earlier epic and put it into his text. So that is a classic example of intertextuality because you need, if, if, if you want to uh, understand Abhijana Shakuntalam, maybe you want to go to first book of Mahabharata and take up the area where uh, the, 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 the intercourse between uh, Dushyanta and uh, Shakuntala goes on and where Shakuntala is more fiery than, uh, or, than in Obhijana Shakuntala. And you can understand the politics of that. Uh, Shakespeare took up uh, stories for his tragedies uh, from Hollinshed's Chronicles, and he took up his histories from Plutarch's lives, and so on and so forth. Now, then, next, next is the idea of heteroglossia by Bakhtin, and uh, this image is the actual uh, representation of what um, heteroglossia means in, as far as dictionary is concerned. It means the presence of various languages, hetero means various, and glossia means languages. So there are there is a presence of various languages. However, uh, Bakhtin used uh, heteroglossia to to signify that within a novel, and he used this in his book uh, the Dialogic Imagination. Earlier, he used it. He, he used the idea, or he came upon the idea in this uh, paper that he presented. Uh, which was later translated as discourse in the novel. So he, of course, pointed out that, you know, there are various voices competing for attention within the novel. For example, in Jainaya. So Jainaya is a single novel, but there are various voices at the same time competing for our attention or our empathy or our uh, understanding. So what are these various voices? Of course, there is a male voice and there is a female voice. There is a genteel uh, voice. There is a working class voice. There is a mad woman voice who is neither working class, who is neither genteel, who knows if she is female or uh, uh, male. In Pride and Prejudice, we can say that there are various voices uh, jostling for, uh, for supremacy or dominance. There is the voice of the rich that is Darcy, and which is highlighted actually. And then there's the voice of the middle class Elizabeth and who plays a, a voice of confirmation uh, rather than a conflict with the, with the rich voice. And then there is the poor, the disenfranchised, the, the have not in the form of Wickham whose voice is actually suppressed and who turns out to be a, um, a, a, a traitor who turns out to be a bad guy, okay? Now, in the Potter in Mandate, his point of view is expressed through language. Like, if you have noticed that in Macbeth, um, while most of the uh, conversations is going on in poetry, the Potter speaks in prose, which shows the status of his uh, livelihood and which is very natural. And Shakespeare is a very good uh, artist. He is very good at uh, characterization. And hence, the Potter, through his language, enables us to see the world from outside, from, from, from the outside of Macbeth's point of view, or from the point of view of a person who is not in the game of uh, becoming uh, a king. Even in uh, Tintin in Tibet, which is one of the texts that I chose for applying these ideas, which is there in the in the syllabus of uh, Bordeman University, where I uh, in, in a college uh, I, I teach in a college in under Bordeman University, and there is this text Tintin in Tibet, which is also a very famous text even outside the syllabus, and we find a number of uh, people uh, talking and talking in even different voices. There is this Puli, and there is this people in Kathmandu, and there is this. A person called Tarki and Haddock, they are all speaking. Sometimes, even in different languages, there is this Uli with whom Haddock uh, has a, a, a runs into, and he uh, the Uli knocks down um, uh, Haddock, and the Uli says in Hindi. So, 
even in that novel, even in that graphic novel, if we can consider that as a graphic novel, then even there, there are so many polyphony of voices, polysemy of uh, voices, which all are in kind of a conflict with each other. And within that conflict, some meaning is rendered dominant, some meaning is rendered suppressed, as I gave the example of Wickham. Now, the next uh, idea that I would like to talk about is the hyper reality. And this is this, this hyper reality is more of a uh, postmodern term rather than a post structuralist term. But I thought it would be good to talk about uh, this within the post structuralist uh, uh, paradigm uh, as well as in the postmodernist uh, paradigm. So this idea was developed in simulacra and simulation in a 1981 book by Baudrillard, and he defines hyperreality as models of a real without origin or reality. And if you remember uh, from uh, the definition of deconstruction that you cannot have an origin, you cannot go to the point of origin. You, you, there is no way in which the origin can be reconstructed. I mean, we can take apart everything that is there including language and try to see what is at the core of everything and yet we cannot reach it. However, hyper reality looks at a very different, uh, hyper reality talks from a different pole altogether. Now, hyper reality says that there are models of a real without origin or reality. I mean, hyper reality doesn't care whether there is an origin or a real thing. Hyper reality is original. So, ori I mean, it, it, the fake is so original that even the original will lose. Like, I don't know what to do in front of this uh, fake um, thing. You can uh, remember these uh, situations happening uh, so often in these uh, Hindi or Bengali serials where some imposter comes and takes on the role of a wife or a husband, uh, tries to take away the money or the wealth or something like that. And it happens in comics as well, where there are like imposters and they wear a mask, uh, Mission Impossible thing. Uh, but it's th the examples of hyperreality is like Santa Claus uh, or Batman. Um, they are not real, of course. And um, but there are so many models of Batman. There are so many models of Santa Claus. There, the Santa Claus story is uh, has entrenched, I think, the entire globe. And according to a survey made by uh, some people. 47% uh, uh, of the grown-up people, elderly people, adult people think that Santa Claus is real, 47% of the people who were surveyed. Of course, um, uh, I was not asked, uh, but then uh, I could have had said, yeah, of course, Santa Claus is real. So the, the, and, and where can I apply it in, in, in literature? Uh, I can apply it again in Tintin in Tibet where the image of the Yeti is being present. The image of the Yeti is unreal. I mean, it's the, the image is real, but the origin is unreal. I mean, we do not have any animal, uh, unfortunately, in Himalayas yet discovered, which looks like the Yeti, which walks on like uh, two legs and is huge and you know has a bad reputation or th things like that. Also, in Abhijana Shakuntala, the world of Marika Rishi. Marika Rishi's world is like perfect. And this is the, the re, this is the reality for a number of uh, uh, people who have who, who has gone there and has seen that it is all real and this is what is uh, the ashram is all about. This is what his hut is all about. This is what his uh, penance grave is all about. I mean, of Marika, not of Onva. So this creation with the help of language, such a world which goes beyond reality, which, which, which supersedes even reality. And the example that Baudrillard gives is, of course, Disneyland. Now, Disneyland is something that is very real. The, the rides are real. But for a child, it might be very real. But for an adult who takes the child there, it might be very costly. Next uh, idea is uh, that of uh, micro narratives. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, here you can see a number of micro narratives. Give a hard look at the screen. You can see it. You can see them. Cannot see them? Well, of course, because they are micro narratives. How can you see them? 
<laughs> okay, that was a bad joke, but no, that's what I want you to understand that only because this image does not reflect a narrative, that does not mean that there is no narrative. So let's take, for example, the narratives of uh, Priyamvada and Anusuya in Abhijana Shakunta. They are not taken to the uh, Sabha of uh, Raja Dushanta. If they had been taken, then they could have had served as witness that, yeah, we saw you flirting with uh, Shakuntala and uh, yeah, we saw you getting married and stuff uh, with uh, Shakuntala. So why are you not recognizing Shakuntala? Again, Bartha Mason in Jainai, she has a narrative of her own, which was developed in the white sargasso sea much later. Just like uh, 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 Fo was written at, from the perspective of Friday, much later than Robinson uh, Crusoe. And then, then there's the dream of Haddock in Tintin in Tibet, where uh, he is mocking the dream of uh, Tintin because it was a dream that made Tintin determine that no, uh, uh, Shang is alive and let's go and uh, save him. So uh, that's it with the ideas or uh, principles of structuralism. Some of the seminal texts are these. Uh, this is just not even the tip of the iceberg. This is the uh, no, little white uh, fume that comes out of the iceberg and the iceberg is like bigger than the ocean i think there are like thousands of books on uh, post structuralism but these books started it all like they are the if you want to go to the origin i mean you will not find anything over there uh, just like in mahesh dattani's uh, play uh, bravely for the queen um, i think it was Alk, uh, i think it was um, alka who uh, says that, uh, you know, let him, let her look outside. She is not going to find anything other than empty space. So these are a few texts which you can uh, look into. You can read if you want to. Now, what are the uh, chief uh, features of uh, post-structuralism? We were discussing about the main ideas or terms of post-structuralism. Now, these are the chief features of uh, post-structuralism. Number one, it challenges the self-sufficiency of the structures. Like I tried to do some exercise with uh, the numbering thing, but I came back to my uh, no, uh, numbering because I myself was getting confused. So it challenges the self-sufficiency of the structures. There are no structures that are self-sufficient. Like if you need to explain something, you need to take the help of some outside referent. Like if you need to define anything, say you need to define language. So how are you going to define language? By using words? I mean, if you are talking to a person, by using words or by using gestures or by writing, all of these things fall under the category of language. So you're trying to talk about language through language. This anti-humanistic, as I already uh, pointed out, it rejects the enlightenment subject. Post-structuralism says that, you know, uh, no matter how many degrees you have got, you know nothing, you know, you are uh, zero. Uh, so that is why it is anti-humanistic uh, and uh, many people do not like it because of that. It is influenced by existential phenomenology. Now, phenomenology is a system of thought or, or an idea that says that if you cannot experience it, like, personally or uh, uh, in a community, that thing doesn't exist. So whatever is, is, it was influenced by uh, existential phenomenology, which says that experience is the way to understand the world. If you do not experience it, you do not understand it. So we need to experience uh, the actual heat of sun in order to like know what how hot sun is again summer thing comes in i don't want to do that but then uh, it's one of the influences of structure it does not have a manifesto like marxism or like uh, feminism or like uh, post structuralism even or structuralism to be more uh, specific it does not have any manifesto because the propounders themselves said that we are not post structuralists 
because the moment you define the moment you put us in this box this box will be deconstructed or we will be deconstructed so we don't want to uh, be deconstructed so there's no manifesto now there was a disillusionment with orthodox marxism uh, post structuralism was not really happy with whatever marxism was trying to say and it challenges many western norms which we will come to one of the ideas within deconstruction so post structuralism could be understood to be the larger egg within that larger egg there is this egg of deconstruction and uh, we will try to slice them and see what's inside so post structuralism argues that founding knowledge either on pure experience phenomenology or systematic structures like structuralism was impossible this impossibility was not meant to be a loss but a cause of celebration and liberation well it's like uh, uh, there's this saying in bangla or uh, it has become a saying it was actually i think a dialogue in the movie which says that which means that since there is no end to learning there is no point of learning um but then uh, i would have been very happy when i was in school or in college and my students would be very happy to hear this that okay it's impossible to know so let's close our books and you know gossip and watch movies and stuff but then gossiping and watching movies are also learning so not like really liberated and you cannot really celebrate and then it says that self is a fiction it's an arena of conflict because your gender your race your class and your profession among other things will constantly uh conflict with each other if you are a, if, if if you are a, a, a male but you belong to say um the the native uh, race and the master will dominate you and if you belong to the higher class or if you belong to the capitalist class but you are a, a female person then the male capitalist will still dominate you and uh, if your profession is something which it is is in opposition with something that is uh, that that your gender is i mean i was once uh, told by by a friend that why are you taking up arts women take up arts why are you taking up arts you you should not take up arts because that became a gender conflict for me and i said that there are many people who took up arts i mean like our teachers took up arts come on i mean like many of them are males so that was there now uh, the self is fiction is being represented by this image of this matrix movie where everything is just a program and it can be changed at any uh, level at at any point in time by people who can change it but the people who can change it are themselves programs and they do not know that they are programs so art and literature cannot reach its absolute truth like there are no alternative ways to reach a truth you cannot if you read a book you still are rendered a kind of uh, ignorant as before you were reading a book uh, if you see art if you read literature uh, even then you cannot reach the absolute truth the reader must understand the text in relation to oneself empowering the reader to understand the text one must understand the self self is constructed by discourse now this is a this is a vicious circle like if i am constructed if i am fictional and if even if i am empowered as a reader and if i want to understand the text with with the relationship with myself then what am i understanding so this fiction of a self is reinforced by the fiction that we read or the non fiction that we read we are a fiction is told by whom by books because we read a book i read a book and it was written that okay you are not real you are a fiction you are constructed by discourse and yet they are saying that the text is understandable the text is meaningful only when we when when you uh, uh, keep it in relationship with yourself which approaches the idea of of a writerly text by uh, rola bat rola bat was using this idea of a writerly text in within this post structuralist idea where he was saying that uh, the text is only half written you can add any meaning to it and then you can create a new text however 
then uh, one of the things that happens in the uh, post structuralist era is that the signified slides under the signified so earlier in in structuralism the 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 uh, signi uh, phi the signifier was at the top and then the signified was at the bottom but in post structuralist terms the signifier becomes more important than the signified because the hyper reality is there because language is constructing our whole world the program that was there in mat matrix was matrix maybe but the program that is there in our lang in our uh, world is called language because everything is created by language according to post structuralists and even by uh, structuralists so uh, stru post structuralism uh, harbors multifaceted response as as we have tried to exemplify in disseminations and then it is more difficult it is more time consuming and it is self contradicted but does the does this not lead us anywhere i don't think that is the case it leads us to this fact that the first thing we need to understand a problem is that there is a problem and i think this constant conflict with your own understanding of something makes us realize that okay there is a problem and we need to address it it challenges hierarchies it doubts sources like somebody says okay uh, you know pritesh i saw a pig fly i would say hmm i am a post structuralist and i i will doubt that or i doubt your source i doubt you as a source because pigs can't fly and then i would see that the pig is really flying so you know so but but i will be doubting sources meta language post structuralists are talking about meta language what is this meta language these are the symbols that replace words and phrases so when we i mean what were words and phrases earlier when the symbols like uh, when the cuneiform or when the hieroglyphics or what in the pictographic script of the chinese uh, culture actually symbols well but some post structuralists say that there could be sim simple symbols in order to replace words and phrases and uh, they talk about meaning and grammar beyond the constraints of a traditional language so uh talk, meaning and grammar can be interdependent or can be very much uh independent of each other according to post uh, structuralists and uh, one of the structuralists uh, noam chomsky who later turned out to be a post structuralist uh, just like bath uh, did talk about this issue in his transformational generative grammar, grammar and then in his minimalist uh, grammar so there is this problematizing of linguistic referentiality like as i said earlier as i pointed out earlier like if you're trying to define something i have been talking for the last one hour and i have been trying to say what post structuralism is according to me and i have been using language which post structuralists say is problematic is inadequate then what am i doing so that is the that is the idea of problematizing the linguistic referentiality there is no outside point from which you can begin the definition of something because nothing begins something that you think begins has already begun okay according to the post structuralists there is a rejection of reason like when we reason something when we say that this is because of this uh we miss out on a number of things that's what post structuralists want to say and therefore they reject uh the dominance of re reason itself the dominance of logic that logic is all perfect they do not want to hear that that logic is all perfect reason is all perfect and finally it was developed in france in the 20th century and it's uh, and it uh, reached its peak in 1960 i deliberately put it at the end uh, or maybe i forgot to uh, i with post structuralism i can get away with anything i think but now this is a fact like if you are looking for uh, something very concrete out of this whole thing i think this one sentence is something that can give you something to hold on to that it, it reached its peak in 1960 let's come to the next slide <clears throat> chief terms key ideas of deconstruction now the one of the first things that uh, people associate deconstruction with is uh, grammatology now grammatology according to derrida himself in his book of grammatology is the science of erasure 
or he uses this uh, French word sausrecher, S O U S R A T U R, sausrecher. Now, this idea of grammatology uh, was developed by Ignace Gelb, Ignace Gelb, in nineteen fifty two in a book, A Study of Writing. And this idea of grammatology was taken up by uh, Derrida much later, but. Uh, what grammatology actually or came to mean was the study of writing systems or scripts. So grammatology simply means the study of writing or scripts, any scripts. Now, where can I apply it in the literature? I thought hard and long on this. Uh, not really thought hard and long. I was just uh, thinking for some time. And I came out that uh, there is not uh, much because not much today because books are printed, which, which, which does not allow us to have distinguishing marks of the writer. But James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake is a writing that is written for on itself. It is not meant to be understood. It is meant to be enjoyed. Now you can question me that uh, how can I, how can we enjoy something that we cannot understand? Well, that's your problem, according to Derrida. You have you you can have a text which gives you pleasure, according to Bath, pleasure, reading, understanding, comprehension. Oh yeah, and zuisense and orgasmic pleasure. Oh, what the hell happened? Something like this. And Penegan's Wake, according to uh, Bath, is one of those Zuisen's texts, which is written just for the sake of writing. For example, Chinese calligraphy as well. Why do they do that, all those things? Or, or martial arts, the kind of martial arts we grew up seeing. Like, why would you move your hand so many times? Maybe it's a distraction, or maybe it's a dance. Maybe it's just for pleasure. But when you write, or when you are using a script, then you too can use it for um, um, pleasure. However, if we need to apply it, we can apply it while reading graphic novels, since at one point in time, they were drawn, even digitally. But if you're talking about book publication, I mean, each book is different from another, even when they're produced in an assembly line, because there will be something, some mark, some, uh, uh, trace, trace is a word in deconstruction, we'll come to that, which will distinguish that book from another book. So even when something is being produced in the assembly line of production, there will be some mark of distinction. And the mark of distinction starts the moment we handle it, we hand, we, we touch it. When we touch it, we put our fingerprints on it. Of course, there are fingerprints of the bookseller and so many other people, but our fingerprints are also imprinted on that book. We write our name uh, to so and so with love. Uh, so do not gift of grammatology to a person with, if you love that person. Don't. Okay, so, um, but we can also make a distinction between this prose and poem using this idea of uh, grammatology. We can stylistically say that, okay, uh, prose and poem are grammatologically different because they are written grammatologically different. It, it sounds good, doesn't mean anything actually. Anyway, let's come to the next idea that is logocentrism. And I think this is the climax of our uh, discussion because uh, I have heard many people go bang into logocentrism whenever we are talking about deconstruction. And uh, I forgot to say this earlier that I am no expert and you have like already wasted so much time listening to a non-expert, but I try my best to uh, understand along with you what logocentrism or I mean, within deconstruction, what logocentrism is. And this idea again was developed by Ludwig Klaes in the 1920s, and it was taken up by Derrida in his book of grammatology. <clears throat> now, uh, if you can look at the uh, extreme uh, right uh, corner of the slide, then there is um, a piece of information. There is a symbol, there is a, 
a representation of course you recognize it because this is universally recognized that um, you know this is the way to the washroom and uh, the one on the left within the little image is for the gentlemen and other is for the ladies or for the women or men women girls boys whatever now the problem with this is that is it really universally so what about the third gender why is the lady presented with uh, a, a kind of a, a dress, a, a kind of a triangle on her, and is the man naked? Hmm. Well, let's not go into that. But this is what I understand from logos, which gives birth to the idea of logocentrism, centering your idea, centering your worldview on the logos. Now, what is logos? According the way I have understood Logos, Logos means everything, like almost everything. But let us focus on what Logos could mean in context to this uh, discussion. According to uh, Ludwig Kleggs or according to um, Peter Barry or according to Derrida himself, Logos is the idea of ideal representation. So if according to Plato, there is a heavenly uh, ideal object, I mean, Plato, Plato says that this world is, a, is, is, is like uh, removed from reality and this is a shadow of reality and, uh, <clears throat> and there's, a, there's a world in heaven which is the perfect world and uh, this is the ideal world. So there are ideal objects over there. And if there are ideal objects, so there will be ideal representations as well. And what is representation? Writing, drawing, sculpting, or um, like mimesis, like play acting, doing something. But this is what the Western, uh, the, the whole Western world, according to Derrida, has made a mistake in. They have put their bets on the logos. They have made everything surrounding the logos. That is, they think that I th that something can be represented ideally. They think that there can be an ideal way of saying a thing. They think that I can build a perfect table or I can draw the table that I see in front of me perfectly or I can describe uh, a table perfectly by writing. But Derrida and Deconstruction denies this. They are against logocentrism. That no, they say that logocentrism is something that should be actually avoid it. Why? Because it is impossible to reach the ideal object. I mean, if there is an ideal object, it is impossible to reach there. And I think, uh, I hope I can come back to this uh, particular 11th slide. In order to make logocentrism more um, funny or more uh, acceptable, I have tried to create a meme. I'm, I'm not a meme creator, but I have tried to create it. Okay, just give ha, ha okay, just a minute. Um, these are the texts that I, okay, this is the one I was looking for. So uh, enlightenment subject, um, uh, positivism, pos positivists, empiricists, phenomenologists, even, uh, to some extent, uh, some structuralists would say, there is a center and we are in it. Like we are in the center of everything. Like everything is like uh, structured and organized and everything is fine. And then the structuralists say, um, there might be a center, there might be a meaning, there might be a truth, but we are not really aware of it. Like, okay, we can reach there, but, there are universal essences, yes. There are truths, yes. 
but we we are not in the center of it like we we can go there but you know we have to work and then uh, the post structuralists come and they say there is no center so stop stop doing whatever you are doing you cannot reach that uh, center and within that deconstruction says wait what is a center so i just uh, try to make things a little uh, light uh, while talking about uh, logo uh, center Uh, who is the the ideal hero the one who fought like a man or uh, the, the the women who fought back who's who's ideal and uh, uh, while british uh, people in shatranj ke khilari i used one of the short stories here uh, to 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 be to be an example in logocentrism uh the british from the british perspective from the western perspective in shatranj ke khilari the way of life uh in in that era or in that place in lucknow i think is decadent but what is decadence how can luxurious palaces how can leisure in the hand of a prosperous group of of people good food song dance be a sure sign of decadence of course you can argue that uh, you know the soldiers were not getting enough to eat there was a lot of poverty uh, uh, in uh, in odd no it was odd not um, lucknow uh, and yet you are saying that how can it be decadent but then whose decadence is it decadence according to the britishers but but there was no decadence according to the indian or or the nawab or the people who were living under the nawab because the british thought modernity and progress to be very different than what we consider progress or modernity to be nowadays we think in the western terms that uh, the more uh, money we have the more um, uh, cars we have the more property we have of course we will be more progressive or more modern but actually in our culture that is not so representation can be very problematic and logocentrism is problematic because it tries to say that what it tries to give us an ideal representation which is false according to derrida phonocentrism and phalocentrism both come under the larger category of logocentrism so phonocentrism i have given the image of the ear because again uh, in the western tradition which follows the greek tradition of uh, socrates and plato where both said that speech should be supreme or speech is better than writing because writing is the carrier of the dead letter according to derrida or uh, writing is false or writing is secondary writing is unnatural so on and so forth so to base our arguments on uh, phonocentrism like on on the word on the on the sound image is as as basing all our ideas all our arguments on the fact that there is some ideal representation and phonocentrism is one of the ways in which we think we can ideally represent something so as an example as an application on abhijana shakuntalam in act 1 priyambada says priyambada tells this to uh, dushanta that your word is enough your word is enough and what we see in the fifth act that let alone his word i mean even uh, seeing shakuntala dushanta cannot remember who shakuntala is and dushanta calls her names like Uh, he he uh, casts aspersions on our character, and yet in the first act we see Priyamvada say that sir your word is enough. 
so word phone phoneme sound is not enough now phallocentrism is a kind of a, a combination of phonocentrism and logocentrism and phallus centric on another hand in another way so uh, it it can mean centering your ideas or centering your uh, thoughts on the maleness or the idea of male malehood or the idea of patriarchy because even uh today we often make a, a mistake by uh, um giving example when we use he or him indiscriminately we do not use she or her as def by default but we use he or his or him as a default example of uh, of by giving any examples and it is not even uh, not not just done by the male members of the society but the female members as well okay but this is coming down this is changing next uh, idea is that of supplementarity so one idea one word could be the supplement of another word one idea one idea can be used instead of another and i will take the uh, i will take up the example from shooting an elephant by orwell where uh, philosophically he says that the that the mask takes the place of the face the same thing happens in um, bravely for the queen as well they have these masks like they put, they have put up a mud mask when uh, lalita comes in they have like applied a mask on their face and uh, by the end of the play we see that the mask has cracked the mask has uh, fallen off and uh, we can see one reality of the uh, of alka and dolly sisters so one thing face and mask are supplementary to each other now i am adorning now i'm adorning the the mask of a lecturer of a of a speaker of an expert or what not but actually i am very uh, different from all of these things next uh now this is the point of incision into the fabric of a text imagine uh, this uh, image that i have provided here this image of the needle now the needle is inserted into the fabric in order to stitch it right i mean if if the fabric is torn then you will use a needle to stitch it but by stitching the two contradictory ideas that are always there in the language what you are doing is you are forcefully trying to patch them together they are like fighting husbands and wives they are like put together and they are like fighting but outside they are all very uh, you know uh, hunky dory everything is fine but whenever they come home they fight and the more they try to their relationship or the more the text tries to stitch two opposite people two opposite ideas together the more there are these marks of the uh, stitching even if something is not torn uh, even a, a, a cloth can be undone at at some loose end which comes out from the cloth itself i think you have always seen this uh, uh, piece of thread coming out from somewhere and you pull it and like the whole thing gets destroyed i mean it happens with not with like very costly uh, uh, clothes i don't i don't wear costly clothes but it always happens with me that there is something coming out from some uh, uh, cloth and i would like pull it and then the whole thing would come off so it is the cloth it is the thread that created the cloth is something that undoes it so that is at which the suture is visible so um, and this undoing is used is done with language itself language is creating the text like a written text like a book to be read and that the language itself is giving you this idea that okay here it here is the point where you can pull it apart 
for example in jnir now jnir uh, is written during the victorian uh, period and uh, the entire plot of jnir is very well organized everything is happening uh, in the victorian decorous manner however ultimately jane is jane is like jane thinks that somebody is calling to her and rochester calls to her as if in telepathy i mean what it's not wuthering heights how can telepathy all of a sudden happen and the which we knew that uh, jane was actually an x-men or x woman that she had telepathic abilities it is the point where the text can be undone it is the point where we can undo this narrative of sanity as opposed to the insanity of bertha mason like bertha mason was insane that's why rochester had to uh, chain her up because bertha mason tried to burn him and not every anyone else and against this antagonistic narrative of uh, bertha mason the sanity of rochester and jane was put now if i say oh i am getting this telepathic communication uh, from my uh, grandfather Uh, who is dead actually but he is saying that there is some buried treasure in some old house what if i say that and if i go to the uh, meeting to search for that treasure don't you won't you call me crazy exactly as in toba taking why would you divide the country on the basis of a map that is divided and what is the reason what is the logic so that is where suture comes in and that is where you can put suture uh, in in tinted in tibet as i already said that uh, there is this dream thing which is kind of telepathy and even if you take up the theme of friendship in uh, tinted in tibet and i would argue that if re- if tintin would really care about hadop if tintin was really very careful really very loving about his friends then why didn't he go out all alone without informing anyone because he knew that he is putting the life of his friend adok and snowy in danger so that is the point at which we can say that no there is some problem analyze let's enter into the text more and more it's like itching the more you itch the more the itching uh, spreads and then uh, let's come to this idea of trace that i talked uh, about earlier now trace is simply something that is understood and not said something that screams silently within the dominant discourse within the dominant dominant idea of the text for example uh, bertha mason like she literally literally screams but she is not given the proper treatment or she is not given uh, the understanding that she deserves and yet her narrative is there embedded and later we will come to understand what 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 was the problem and then in uh, pride and prejudice there were like seven eight or nine marriages and there was not even a single word about sexual intercourse nine marriages wow i mean hats off to uh jane austen for not talking about it because how can we even talk about uh, marriage and not talk about uh, uh, sexual um, relationships and the same idea the same idea of trace can be understood in the post colonial theory can be understood in gender theory can be understood in any other areas of critical analysis so this idea of trace is very much useful in w- w- when we are going to do some critical analysis of some uh, uh, text because whenever somebody is trying to suppress your voice um that uh, uh, that that act of suppression actually leads to more incitation of uh, uh, rebellion it's like uh, if you hit your child and uh, the child is like sobbing and you say uh, don't sob then the child starts to cry so you know that's how the trace thing 
the, the writer or the author or the person who tried to suppress it, the more he tries to, he or she tries to suppress it, the more uh, the, 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 the suppressed ideas come to life. And uh, this term bricolure is a term that can be applied anywhere. Like it is something that can be inserted anywhere and it can work. So it's like um, I know, a universal uh, USB bus. You, you can like uh, you use it in any computer and it will work. So it's bricolure is a term that has many implications that can be used almost uh, anywhere without uh, creating any uh, problem of um, change. Then comes another important uh, term of uh, deconstruction that is difference with the like acute accent on E, which is which makes it different from uh, difference. So this is what uh, um, uh, wants to call as sign under erasure. So uh, erasure is a constant process of destruction, which continues along with construction, along with creation. And whenever we are using a sign, the idea of deconstruction, the idea of its destruction is created simultaneously. So difference is actually an idea that says that one word actually leads to another word in an associative movement. So if you use one word and th that will lead to another and that will lead to another and that will lead to yet further words. So it actually means a kind of a delay, delay in getting the, in getting the meaning. Like, it comes from the word difference, which means difference, like two things are different. But it actually means that when, whenever you're trying to use a word, it will, will require more words to explain. It, and that will delay your accepting, that will delay your reception of the meaning. If you consider uh, meaning, if you consider logos, I said that logos can mean so many different things, including God. So if you take this logos, this ideal representation to be God, then in waiting for Godo, there is infinite difference because uh, Vladimir and Estragon comes every day and the difference is there every day. They are delayed. The, the meaning never comes. The climax never comes. The, the God, the person who has given the appointment to these trams never come. So there is a con constant difference. And this difference is something that is to be found in many, many um, post-modernist uh, uh, texts, including Ulysses, including um, 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 You're Bravely for the Queen and Waiting for uh, Godo, of course. Next is um, the aporia. Now, aporia is a sense of doubt in, 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 the, in, the, in the paradigm of rhetoric. It simply means a sense of doubt, like doubting sources of within the post-structuralist idea. Aporia is the difference between the supposed meaning of a word or a concept and the idea or the concept that we as the readers or we as the receptors. Are. Now, uh, Derrida says that uh, aporia means the complicity of origins. Complicity of origins simply means that, as I said, there is no origin where you can go and say, okay, here I am. This is the origin. This is the center. This is where everything began. I mean, I have been naming Derrida a number of times, but there are other deconstructionists as well. And they also said the same thing that there is no origin. They're all the same. Like if you travel to the North Pole and say that, okay, this is the North Pole because your compass tells it so. Then the question would be North Pole as opposed to which pole, 
then they would be they would say the south pole but then how will you find out the south pole point in time where you are standing in north pole so aporia is this constant instability that lies underneath our every attempt of grasping at meaning whenever we try to grasp at the meaning we get something and many things are left out as i was talking about uh, as i was uh, saying that this uh, this theory whole theory thing is a kind of a jelly that cannot be stuck to the ceiling with a nail i think aporia tries to tell us that meaning is like in a constant flux in a constant flow and your hand is an attempt to catch that flow of water you your your hand would be moist with water but you you cannot catch the flow there is not much water that you can hold in your hand or even in your uh, box or even in your uh, bottle whatever you can catch the flow of course it is associated with this idea of archi writing and archi writing is also uh, a kind of an offshoot of this idea of aporia which says that there is an irresolvable internal contradiction a logical disjunction in a text which are not which cannot be resolved so in comedy we have happy ending but say for example uh, obijana shakuntala or mrichya katika in navajana shakuntalam uh, we have a happy ending like uh, shakuntala agrees uh, that okay fine you insulted me but since you are a man and since you are a king you are rich okay i'll go with you okay fine so that was the happy ending in mrichya katika um uh basant sena was agreed to or accepted as a wife but what about the wife of the chief protagonist do we hear her voice do we uh, see her talking do we uh, find charudatta's wife to say anything at all i don't remember her accepting uh, vasant sena but back then it was a possibility so uh, it happened but that happy ending will not be a happy ending if mrichya katika or abhijana shakuntalam has to be adapted uh, or adopted as a play in today's uh, perspectives because there is an irresolvable uh, conflict between maybe these two people uh, maybe charudatta's wife and uh, vasanta sena and also charudatta uh, was revived due to Uh, 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 the assertion of the throne. What happens if it happens back? Like it, it gets reversed. So, archi writing is the acceptance of this irresolvable internal contradiction that whenever I write one word, within itself, it will have uh, some source of contradiction. Say, for example. everyone this word everyone do you think this is a very innocent word and everyone is just a adjective but within that there is two oxymoronic entities sorry one is every and the other is one both are married together in the uh, altar of adjective but every and one are very different words another word that comes to my mind is cleave c l e a v e cleave so cleave can mean both to attach and to put something to cut something in half cleave so this is what archi writing uh, could be and uh, uh, this irresolvable play of um, ideas can be understood in another uh, way from abhijana shakuntalam because Dushanta offers his ring to Priyamboda as well. So, if he is offering his ring to Priyamboda as well, how how uh, important that ring would be to him? 
if he is ready to offer it to Piyambada as well, not for marriage, but to clear the debt that Shakuntala had, uh, that Piyambada had, uh, that had placed on Shakuntala. So the ring, which names the play, which has its existence in the title of the play, is not considered to be too important by the king, but it becomes ironically and archi writingly uh, becomes important for the identification of a uh, uh, of a lady whom the king had uh, promised to marry. Anyway, let's come to the next uh, idea that is erasure. Now, erasure is this act of cutting out or this act of not saying something and yet giving us enough space or giving us enough hints to make us understand that this thing exists. For example, in the third act of Bravely for the Queen, we find this old lady under the tarpaulin or the character of Kanahinya. We don't know if Kanaya was really there or it was just a figment of imagination or whether this old lady was really there or just a figment of imagination or in the in the uh, in Tintin in Tibet in, on page eight of that particular comic book that uh, we, uh, we are reading, um, uh, there's this pin that is shown to lie on the road and the car in which Tintin and his uh, friends were uh, just we were supposed to you know, collide, but uh, the pin was not a, a problem at, uh, at the end of the panel for the uh, car. The car bypassed the pin, but the pin was there. It's like pinning through something and yet letting it there for the fact that we used this idea first and then we came to disregard this idea, but this idea, but this character, like an absentee character, uh, is already uh, there in the text. Okay. Now, metaphysics of absence, what is this? Uh, this is all, also a very much talked about um, idea in deconstruction. And this uh, idea is something that is uh, uh, uniquely uh, associated with deconstruction because Derrida says that the entire notion of Western episteme, the entire notion of episte uh, the entire notion of Western knowledge is based on the fact that what is now and what is here. If you look at the Western uh, lifestyle, if you look at the Western ways of thinking and which we uh, follow very uh, generously, is to have things in writing is to have like things in email is to have things in your uh, bank uh, is to have things in your locker this culture of knowledge is the culture of now is the culture of here that is the metaphysics of presence but derrida is talking about the metaphysics of absence what is not said what is not written what is not understood the space outside the space of the little knowledge that we have that is the metaphysics of absence um i i understand that metaphysics of absence should in order to talk about it we need to have another two hours just devoted to metaphysics of absence. But in a nutshell, what I can say is that at metaphysics of absence registers a complaint against the Western idea of thought, which says that whatever can be seen, can be analyzed, whatever can be read, whatever can be thought about is and looks back to the maybe the Eastern philosophies, uh, Hindu philosophy maybe, or Sufi philosophy maybe, which says that first, there are things which we cannot even think about. 
only because we cannot think about them it is not the fact that they, they do not exist they exist but we cannot think about them in terms of meaning in terms of language in terms of ideas and also in terms of supernatural things but if i need to bring this whale of idea into the aquarium of a text then i would like to um, um, talk about ghost stories or talk about purloined letter where the letter was never seen but the letter the existence of the letter was a palpable fact or i would talk about the image of bertha mason we hardly uh, saw bertha mason in jnr but her presence was always there so only be, only because bertha mason was not there in front of us it did not mean that she was not there she was always there in the attic as the mad woman in the attic so uh, this is a, a very badly described uh, metaphysics of absence as, as i said that if you want to apply metaphysics of absence we have to talk about the things that are not here and now but but the things that can be there the possibilities of possibilities are referred to by the metaphysics of absence as far as i i can understand what metaphysics of absence is okay and then some seminal texts on uh, of uh, on of of grammar of uh, deconstruction includes uh, these texts you can uh, go through them if you uh, like to now the chief features of post structuralism so it looks deeply into the language we have already understood that that i have talked mainly about language so uh deconstruction post structuralism are both interested in the language of the text so the one thing that post structuralism and deconstruction looks at in the text is its language so it looks at two things the text and within it the language text language textual language and that is why derrida once said famously or infamously that there is nothing outside the text because they want to just look at the text and the language so it tries to destabilize hierarchies that there is nothing holy there is nothing supreme there is if, if there is nothing original then uh, why are why do we even use the word fake to have a derogatory sense and as i said it believes that the seeds of destruction of an idea lies within itself it does not have a center and there is no truth and if there is any it can't be reached by language at least so that's why they have this meta language the symbols and all which also falls short and one word leads to another in an endless loop the the image i have tried to produce uh, as the ideal representation of this endless loop uh, which is far from ideal and <laughs> i say that there is nothing outside the ppt but i'm like mocking or i'm like using this idea of nothing outside the text and of course it is uh, i i i wanted to say that nothing is outside the text so this text is right now in front of you is ppt so i was saying that and it is anti structuralist as we have already uh, found out this is a post structuralist map um which is of course it does not really have a nice structure and using this map you will be lost in the uncharted territory of isms but these are the names of the people who really matter and uh, though there is a kind if you think there is a kind of a center but it is not really the center i mean there could be you can take any one particular name or idea to be the center so this is just a post structuralist map with a number of um, uh, people in it major proponents of uh, post structuralism uh, you know all of them and uh, these are people uh, whose ideas we already uh, talked about so i'm just putting a face to uh, trying to ideally represent trying trying to be logocentric and trying to put a face on these um, ideas uh, the same with uh, deconstruction we already talked about the ideas of all these people uh, maybe not of hartman but other than that i have tried to touch upon everyone okay and these are the 
poems. These are the names of the poems that I wanted to use uh, uh, and novels on short stories. Uh, well, this is also an image that I think is uh, very reflective of uh, the idea of this uh, conflict. She is moving forward, but she's looking backward. So Raja Rao's painting could be uh, understood as a as an image, as, an, as a representation, perhaps, of uh, this dual or this plural uh, 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 representation or plura plurality of representations. Now, in Tintin in Tibet, with the English uh, front cover is putting the characters on the left and look at the Arabic representation. So um, even the situation or even the location of the characters is not central because they can change with the language. And uh, this was the uh, first uh, poem, Triumph of Life by Shelley, on which deconstruction started to uh, use their uh, ideas. It was the guinea pig uh, on which they exercised their ideas of uh, deconstructing. And if you want to get the idea, if you want to get the definition of deconstruction in an article, according to Spivak in her preface to of grammatology, she writes this, to locate the promising marginal text, to disclose the undecidable moment, to pry it loose with the positive lever of the signifier, to reverse the resident hierarchy, only to displace it, to dismantle in order to reconstitute what is all, all, always already inscribed. Deconstruction in a nutshell. I mean, this nutshell is huge. It's like the like Jupiter-sized nutshell, but nutshell nevertheless. And I talked about this poem as well. She walks in beauty like the night and the image is darkish, uh, but what are the birds doing at night? So they might be owls or bats. Um, Jenaer I talked about, and this is also something that we talked about. And uh, so coming to the, towards the end of this uh, discussion uh, or lecture, I would like to say that not only in uh, literature, but we can represent, um, uh, uh, deconstruction or post-structuralism in a number of other mediums, including teaching in feminism, in Dalit discourse, in law, and in teaching, we could try to answer where to begin. Like we can begin from the one from the first chapter, or should we begin from the end? Oh, this we already did, uh, and so there is this little differentiation between structuralism, post-structuralism, and deconstruction. Uh, where we already talked about these things like grand narratives and micro narratives, reality, hyper reality, there is no reality, and things like that. So you can just have a quick look at it because I think I'm coming towards the end of the uh, lecture. There's, I, there's nothing that I should like uh, try to describe here other than the signifier signified thing, which means the same thing uh, in deconstruction because in deconstruction, um, nothing is. Um, uh, really there. It's like already not there. Okay. Now there are arguments against post-structuralism, uh, this, that they are non-humanistic and it is nihilistic in its approach. They don't provide any solution. And Jürgen Habermas is one of the scholars who is very much against post-structuralism and deconstruction. And, uh, though the post-structuralists say, uh, that, uh, there, there, there is micro narratives, but there's a danger that post structuralism itself has become a meta narrative. Deconstruction also it's too linguistic, it's too abstract, and it does not suggest any alternatives to the problems of writing or the problems of speech or the problems of drawing. This is a like of course a very small bibliography that I could pull up, and there are as I said thousands of books, but you can begin from here. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions and suggestions, you can send at this address. And I understand that uh, I am overshooting my limit. So I would uh, stop sharing and uh, let uh, Dr. Banerjee uh, say whatever he has to, if there are any questions. I'll just ask you to keep keep sharing the last oh, slide. That some oh, of the, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. Just, uh, you know, uh records your email id if okay. they are interested they can uh put in few queries there as well yeah sure, sure. Uh, that would be and, uh, 
yeah and as usual uh, a very lucid lecture and of course uh, uh, a very a very serious topic a very important topic very well dealt with in details with very clear concepts and examples i think the examples were very very good uh, keeping in mind the heterogeneity of the students and i am sure the examples uh, that you have given you know, were understood very well and uh, it was a, a really a pleasure a mental feast for all of us uh, to go through this topic in your own uh, style uh, that is uh, a, a, a mixture of seriousness with humor uh, that uh, you know uh, that made this topic this very uh, sometimes very difficult topic uh, very comprehensible and uh, thank you very much for 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 you know very lucidly presenting this this lecture in a in a, in a very detailed manner and i i am sure the participants have thoroughly enjoyed uh, your lecture there is a request from the participants if and if you can go back to the previous slide containing the bibliography although it is limited but uh, the big for the beginners i think that would be a great source of uh, you know reference so on behalf of dad boy we thank you there are few questions with your due permission i will take those questions and put it across okay uh, sure uh, but i'm trying to go back but it seems uh, it has given me a long leash this ppt has but it mm -hmm. seems it is stuck let me stop sharing and then try again maybe that would uh, uh, help me right. share the bibliography okay and yes questions would you read them to me or do you want me to go to the chat box and read them out both ways uh, you can uh, also I think have be an better. i'll moderate yeah, yeah it'll be better if you read them to me because i'm trying okay. to wrestle with this right, uh, right. bibliography thing right okay so you can tell me the first question if i would know the answer i'll try to do whatever i can i'll just see few other questions mm -hmm. what is the significance of this critical apparatus if it is merely an interplay of signifier and dignified i think it is signified and it dismantles you, even hierarchy and ideology can you uh, please repeat the question what is the significance of this critical apparatus which apparatus if it is merely an interplay of signifier and signified and it dismantles even hierarchy and ideology oh yeah so what is the significance of post structuralism or what is the significance of deconstruction you see i tell the people who talk to me i, I tell the uh, tell my students that you know the all these theories are all okay within the classroom but outside do not try to practice all of them because that would lead to a lot of depression that would lead to a nihilistic feeling inside you so if you want to know the implication of post structuralism and deconstruction within the academic field on a paper that you are writing well huge like i mean even if some people say that theory is there it is not because it is still there in our syllabus until it is there in our syllabus we cannot say that it's dead it may be in the coffin but it's not dead so the implication is that if you use these ideas to see the text then it will get to this interplay of signifier and signified yes but it does not mean that you do not go anywhere as i said this interplay between signifier and signified uh, has to be appreciated and understood that what the, the language that is there in the text is inadequate the inadequacy of the language will allow you or help you to understand and guess that whatever the author and in, in a metaphor there are authors in politics there are authors in the legislature there are authors as our uh, uh, or, or or our religious texts this exercise might in some way help us challenge or undo the play that they have in their texts 
the constitution, the Bible, the Gita, the, uh, the whatever pamphlets have been written on those serious subjects. So in literature, in theory, this is a kind of a um, play that it's a rehearsal that you can do in your academic uh, world by using these ideas on heavier uh, uh, and more important texts that affect us daily. So I think that is how I would say that why post-structuralism and deconstruction is still relevant. If I don't know if I could answer your question, but that's how I think it, that, that, that's what it meant to me. Thank you. The next question is, can we consider Jacob's room as an example of metaphysics of absence? Um, metaphysics of absence. The absence of the outside. The absence of experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in that sense, yes, we can. We can, like... Um, the, the experience or the presence of um, the room uh, can be criticized, can be uh, debunked, can be punctured. The, the, the existence of this uh, induced claustrophobia can be uh, uh, understood or can be uh, explained by the metaphysics of absence. It can be. It will be a long process, but it can. Thank you. Uh, now is uh, is from uh, Pallavi Chakravarti, and uh, she says that do you think deconstruction is somewhat nihilistic or pessimistic, since nothing will come out of nothing, or or just a sec. Yeah. Or do do you think? Or do you think it is very Heart lie seeds of what exactly? I mean, uh, I, I'll try to read them. I'll, I'll read it. Yes, I'll read it once again. Yeah, okay. Uh, do you think deconstruction is somewhat nihilistic or pessimistic since mm -hmm. nothing will come out of nothing? Or do you think at its very heart lie seeds of optimism? Moreover, oh. moreover, Bakhtin talks about carnivals as a mode of temporary reversal of established order. So can a permanent reversal of order be reached or will that be falling into pitfalls of another structure? Well, you gave your own answer. Yes, permanent reversal. I mean, the term itself is paradoxical. Like if, if something is reversed permanently, then there will be no permanent structure that will be there. And in that, we are actually living in that uh, cartwheel of uh, uh, permanent reversals, but we are not being able to see these reversals because the reversals start as soon as the other reversal ended. And as far as your deconstruction, uh, as far as your question about deconstruction, whether it is nihilistic, yes, it is nihilistic. But as deconstruction says, if it is nihilistic, if they agree that it is nihilistic, and I agree that it is nihilistic, then of course it is the other way around as well, that it has a core of hope and within that core of hope there is nihilism and within this that nihilism there is a core of hope so it's a you know it's an ongoing process it, 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 it should never end thank you uh, next question is by somojoti banerji and uh, she says that is there any any connection between bill brown's think theory and the concept of logocentricism uh, whose theory again Bill Brown's Think Theory. I'm sorry, I have not read about this Think Theory. Are you talking about String Theory or Thing? Thing. String. Thing. No. H I N G. No. Thing. No, no, no. I, I can't. I can't answer this because I have not read about this. No. Sorry okay. for that. So no, no issues at all. Uh, yeah. So with that, we come and of course, the email ID has been shared. Uh, the uh, the participants can get back to our resource person. And is the bibliography now visible? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. It has been visible for a long time. And I'm, I'm sure the participants have uh, jotted down the beginners. For the beginners, these are the basic yeah. books that 
they should go through. Uh, thank you very much for uh, such an interesting and, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody says scintillating session and for your pertinent answer. Uh, before we uh, close the session, may I request my uh, organizer, my co-organizer, uh, and uh, the, the, the pivot around which this series is revolving, uh, Dr. Shreya Bhattacharya, ma'am, to please convey her vote of thanks. So I have stopped sharing, okay. Thank you. Well, uh, a very good evening to one and all, I think. Uh, after a very, very long time, Dr. Pritesh, I have enjoyed a session so much, you know. It has been absolutely brilliant. And at the same time, your inimitable sense of humor, I think that is what must have reached out to all the participants as it has reached out to me. You know, talking about something, you know, which most uh, scholars think to be very difficult, something like post-structuralism and deconstruction. And at the same time, making it so interesting and uh, at the same time, uh, so humorous. You know, we, I think even I didn't realize that you have been speaking for more than two hours and I'm sure it's the same with the, uh, the, the participants. I, and, and your range, you know, it was, uh, when uh, Shoikat and I were thinking and in our uh, sessions before this uh, series actually began, we were thinking of application vis-a-vis -a, -vis a couple of texts. But what you did was really wonderful, you know. Each concept was illustrated not by one text, but several. And the, ra the range, I truly appreciate that from Abhigyanam Shakuntalam to uh, Tintin in Tibet, you know, uh, there was something for everyone. And uh, it was really, really what I keep on saying, a cerebral feast for all of us. On behalf of uh, Team Dat Voyage and Shoikat and myself, I extend my thanks to you. And I hope we, you will be with us in all our uh, academic ventures in the future. And I also thank all the participants for being with us tonight. Uh, please spread the word that those who weren't, they really missed out on something truly beautiful, truly illuminating. So thank you once again. It was a pleasure having you on board. And uh, tomorrow we meet again, same time at six for another feast. This time it would be on feminism. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.